It's time now for our first hot topic, and uh, we're talking about the fact that the president has launched expatriate employment levy. We'll get to find out what that is and how it's going to impact on the economy. And uh, we're being joined by Mr. Bolahan Olojede, a public affairs analyst. Good morning, and welcome to the program, Mr. Olojede. Yeah, good morning. Nice to be on the program. Mm. Everything is being done. Frantic efforts are being made to make sure that our economy improves. And the president has just launched this uh, expatriate employment levy, saying that it will bring more money, it will make for more employment opportunities for our people, and so many other uh, glowing things that this thing is going to bring to us. First of all, make us understand what this actually means. Well, essentially, this is just something to um, channel or, or, or to influence um, the employers of expatriates to look inside Nigeria for their staffing. So rather than bring, uh, uh, say, Chinese or European or other, other, other members of the uh, international community and employ them for certain rules, for which there are competent Nigerians, there are, there are skills that are available in country. Um, it, it, we, the, the government is trying to tune the attention of these employers um, to employ Nigerians instead of the uh, foreigners that have been employed. It should help to bolster employment, and then the levy that you have to pay for uh, Employing expatriate uh, could be a disincentive for employing expatriate while at the same time, where you must, uh, you pay levy and government make some income by virtue of that. Um, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that you put into the entire mix uh, to help drive up employment and maybe to a certain extent revenue. But I think more of employment is, is some sort of local content version, a version of um, in, in, that, that is more pervasive outside of the uh, usual oil and gas uh, area where we have strong local content issues. Yeah, because I was, apart from the fact of uh, this payment, if you, are, you have to ex employ an expatriate, uh, which I didn't hear before now, um, I was wondering what the marked difference was between this and what we've already had in place before, even though it's not being adhered to. This quota system for indigents, uh, the employment of indigents in, in jobs that indigents can do. I don't know how this is different from that, apart from this payment that has been attached to it. The pay pay payment, payment changes behavior. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, it's a different case when all you are saying is, oh, you must obtain your expatriate quota, you must file uh, your expatriate returns and all of that. Now that there is a disincentive for hiring expatriate and an incentive for hiring Nigerian, uh, it, it will definitely have certain influence on behavior of, of the applicable employers. That right there is the difference, the levy. I'm just, uh, well, I'm, I'm curious. Sometimes, let's say, uh, price of fuel goes up. The transporter will put the price, the extra price, on the passengers that, that take these buses or these cars and all that. Now, we've already found a situation where the government insists that jobs that can be taken by Nigerians should not be given to expatriates. That, it, that was the existing law. And a lot of these... Uh, uh, companies leave that, they, they ignore that and still bring their expatriates here and then pay them more. Some of whom are even, we hear, uh, prisoners in their, in their country serving a jail term here in Nigeria and all that. Uh, we've heard all those kind of things, but that's, they still pay them more than they pay the Nigerian workers, maybe even of the same cadre as the ones they bring from overseas. Now, will this not be a situation where because they are bringing people from their countries or anywhere else, they are still going to uh, remove or reduce the price or the, the salaries of the Nigerian workers. I'm just, I'm just being pessimistic here. Uh, to, in order to, for them to pay for the expatriates that are, that are bringing from outside the country. 
Will it not affect us well, uh, negatively? That will be something for the Nigerian Labour Congress, um, where they, they have a mandate for issues around employer, employee, and, you know, their relationship. But they've not been able so to solve I, this I, problem I, I, I all this while. They've that not is, been able to solve this problem all this while. The disparity sure? between the payment of the expatriates and uh, the Nigerian people, I'm not sure they've been able to solve this. How do you think they can solve this now? Well, <clears throat> sorry. I, I, I still don't believe that you can uh, truly legislate and effectively legislate that, that you can step into that place and say, this is how much you must pay. Beyond issues around minimum wage, how do you tell uh, an employer of labor that uh, you must pay this this person, you must pay this other person? Where there are issues around um, a disparity in treatment that are believed to be unfair, unfair labor practice, it either becomes an issue of litigation or something for Nigerian Labor Congress to step into. That is what that institution is set up to, to do. So your people are being cheated, then you sit back. And you are expecting that it to be somebody in Abuja who will help you to solve that problem. I, I, I think labor has to do a, a, a lot that we are currently seeing. But who are labor? Because a lot of these people are casual workers. You know, uh, you go there, it's not as if they are staff. They are casual workers. They pay them a, a certain sum of money. Uh, the other people who come from there, I don't know whether they are staff or they bring them as casual workers as well, but they still earn more. Now, if labor is talking to these companies regarding these people, will, will, they, will they have that right? Are these casual workers also part of labor? The, you see, labor is actually a lot more important than the credit we're giving to them, or maybe than what they are doing in our own environment. We've seen Labour shut down Canada, shut down some part of Europe. In fact, in the past couple of weeks, there have been certain farmers' uh, 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 union uh, uh, issues in some part of Europe. And those things, they, they cause the attention of all stakeholders to discuss, negotiate, and resolve the issues at stake. So while an individual factory worker may not be strong enough, that is where Labour comes in. Because labor is an organized uh, uh, society, it's an, an organized structure that is much bigger and stronger and can effect changes as far as labor practices is concerned. So what, what you are probably saying is that our labor has not been living up to the expectation. That is what I hear you say. Uh, really, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me put it differently. In some organizations, even here in Nigeria, their staff are not uh, allowed to have a union. Now, if there's a problem in an organization like that, where there is no union, which is affiliated to labor, you know, officially, and there's a problem in that organization, can labor intervene when these people are not actually their members, even though they are in the labor market? When they are not unionized, um there are alternatives. There is an entire court whose purpose of being set up was to resolve labor matters. I have taken my own former employer to court the industrial court, and I got justice for, for, for the injustice that was done to me. So there are structures within the system that are dedicated to what you're talking about. Mm. If you're not unionized and labor cannot come to you, Go to the industrial court and make your case. Mm. Okay, very good. Now, what of the impact on um, on uh, uh, FDI? You know, some people have the fear that when you disincentivize—that's the word you use—the uh, this bringing of ex expatriates from other countries. Some people might just be. Uh, very reluctant to come and invest in Nigeria because they have faith in the people that they bring, but they know now that if they want to bring these people, they are going to bring those people at a huge cost to themselves. So they might be discouraged. Do you think that as well? Well, um, I, I will extend, in my response, I will extend that, that question. 
uh, that question. It, it, it does appear that Nigerians have, um, I feel like, well, it's an overbloated image of our capacity to deliver artisanship, especially. Our people are horrible with artisanship. Mm. And we're, and it is a call on us, it's not an it's not just an indictment, it's a call on us that we must look at our education, the nature of our education, and see how we can infuse the necessary skills to be able to deliver at the level of competence that some of these people are delivering. People in construction in Lagos would rather go to Kotonou to go and break tilers than to use Nigerian tilers. Why? The skills are not. We've just completed, uh, 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 I, I've been involved in recently in, in a building project. The kind of finishing that I've seen, I've seen to, to the end. So where you have a, a foreigner who has come, and, and where he is coming from, he has trained hands with capacity to deliver to the quality that he wants. The tendency is that they want to bring those people in, not beyond the issue of providing jobs for their own people. It's also guaranteeing the quality of the job that will be delivered by their own people mm. better than what our poor capital do. So it, it, it is a call on the entire system because it involves a lot of factors that we're talking about here. Then when you bring somebody from, say, uh, uh, Ghana to come and work in Nigeria, the, the, it will definitely earn a little more because you're bringing him to a strange environment. He doesn't... So there are certain inconveniences that are associated with pulling that guy from where he is to where you want him to come and work. And there must be some sort of compensation for that above someone who is at home already mm -hmm. and you are giving the same job. Mm -hmm. That is part of the problem that, that, that we're facing. So we need to extend it largely and ask people, especially who are, who are hiring uh, 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 casual workers, and they will tell you the story of the Nigerian artisan, artisan, artisanship space. It is not a very nice story from plumbing to electrical works to tiling to everything that you can think about. So let's fix that in our own desire, designing of what we call education or acquisition of skills to have people who are competent. These are part of the thing that will help this initiative that the government is talking about to also succeed. It, it, it even maybe goes beyond uh, competence. I, I think we might have artisans that are very competent, but will they, will they not cut corners? Because cutting corners does not really mean that you, you are not competent enough, but are you disciplined enough? Are you, do you have the integrity to deliver on what you promise that you are going to deliver? Because molding of blocks, for instance, you know how to mold blocks. You know the measure that you should use uh, per <clears throat> bag of cement. But you want to use one bag of cement to mold like a hundred blocks. That is not because you don't know how to mold blocks, but it's because you want to make more profit. And that is uh, a place I think our people are most guilty. But the question I, I ask, and I'm, I'm going back to it, is that Will this not discourage people who want to come and invest in Nigeria, people who believe that the kind of business they want to come and do here, the expertise they need and the integrity they need will only come from outside? With this kind of law, will they not be discouraged coming to Nigeria? I don't, I don't think it's enough to discourage anybody, any investor who is sincere and sees an opportunity in an environment. You're talking about the skills you require to deliver on the uh, uh, or to deliver the returns on your investment. If those skills are available in the country where you are, uh, then why can't you get them and use them? Why should that be a discouragement that they will not allow you to bring your, your skill from the other side? The only problem I see is where there are no such skills. I, I, I will give you an, 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 an example. There was an oil company that where where um, I, I, I used to have an office. My office used to be there. When they started business, they built an entire tower and it was filled with expatriates. But over time, all the expatriates have left and have been replaced by Nigerians. So once the labor that you require are available, it should not be a disincentive for you to come unless. You have another motive. If the motive is investment, 
it's a different story if you are a government person and you have a mandate to bring people from your country to come and employ in another person's country. That's a different story. But if your mandate is investment and what you are shooting at is return and the skills that you need are available in the country, then you shoot for your investment and make your money and quit. Mm. Unless you have other agenda. Okay, so, but you made a comment that um, we need to look inward and uh, talk to ourselves concerning artisanship in Nigeria. Uh, but now this pronouncement has been made, the law has been made, uh, expatriates will, you will have to pay for expatriates that you bring and all that. Um, I don't want to ask whether it is premature to do this. We should have, uh, is it the chicken before the egg or something? Should we have done that inward looking before we bring this kind of a law down or not? But I'm asking, now that this has come, uh, what do we do to repair the wrong that possibly made it possible for other, uh, for people to bring uh, expatriates into the country in the first place? Like you said, we should look inward. So what do we do now when the law is already here? Well, it's, it's, it's never too late to, to look inward, to actually analyze that space properly. Um, maybe we put the cut for the folks, um, but then... It is what it is today. So let's go look inward into that space. I have a live experience with me, a building project complete. And the, the snagging eh, is, is something totally, totally embarrassing in some of the area. Mm. So those skills, if you're going to be a plumber, a, a plumber in, 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 in Europe, you get some certification, certain training. If you're going to be whatever artisanship uh, space you find yourself, you're properly trained to deliver on those things and, and you're certified as such. But the quality of work we are seeing with our people should call us back to those days of those vocation school, technical schools, and the skills that are acquired in all those spaces. Okay. It is not everybody that needs to be uh, a university graduate to be able to. Uh, to be able to earn a fair wage by virtue of the skill that they have learned and are able to deliver. So we need to go back and find out why all those institutions that used to produce those people, why they died. I, I, I was in a house uh, uh, sometime last week, it was built in the 60s. If you see the skills, the level of artisanship that, I, that is on ground in that building, Marvelous. I was just comparing it to my own recent experience of a building built in 2023-2024. And I'm asking myself, where were those skills, skills people? Where were those artisans that worked on this 1960-something building and com com compare it to 2024? Mm. Something happened. All those skills disappeared. We need to do something about it. Okay. Um, we're done with this. Let's just digress a little bit, and our time is uh, really short. Um, but I'd like your comments on what has happened recently. The MPC raised the, um, the interest rate to 22.77% or something like that. And their excuse is that it's going to fight inflation. And a lot of us do not even understand. This is economics. This is, this is money matters that we don't know how it works. Um, would like to know your comments on this. Raising interest okay. rate um, and then fighting inflation, how does it relate? Yeah. Uh, one, one, one of the major problems that the CBN fight is inflation versus interest rate. Uh, because most of the time, the two of them are pulling in opposite direction. So you need to now ask yourself, how do I find the delicate balance in between these. Uh, we have currently in Nigeria a case in which several trees are falling on top of one another. So and when you have such a scenario, you want to ask yourself, which one is the topmost tree that I need to lift first uh, so that we can begin to deal with the other ones that are underneath. So we, there is the monetary tightening. What, what, what the government is trying to do is to tighten the monetary uh, uh, space so that the volume of Naira that is available in the system, which are part of what is contributing to that sloppy 
slide of the naira, of the naira against the dollar. So many people that naira in the system. So people are using this naira to purchase the acquisition of dollars, not because they are importing anything, but because they want to stockpile it as a store of value. So we've seen a situation in which some weeks ago, via the uh, uh, the, uh, the treasury bill that was sold, government mopped up over one trillion naira. And like that is in a 365 uh, a, a day instrument the loop was almost one trillion so that amount is taken out of the system it is not available for the next one year to be running after dollars that are not needed now this what we have seen with the interest rate hike is along the same direction it will mop, mop up the, the the money that is available in circulation and it will further constrain what it will constrain the capacity of people to deploy those naira to chase the wrong stuff that uh, especially in the in the foreign exchange space which we have seen okay it is a tested monetary policy okay and it's been shown to be effective okay. How, however there may be many distortions within our own monetary system right now that may fight against this part, the efficacy of this policy. If you remember, we have been here before when the former governor gradually moved this same MPR from 12%, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18.5, 18.75. That is what we had in the past. Uh, but it did not succeed effectively in curtailing the inflation as we would have loved to see. So there are other distortions that we will need to continue to deal with, but this is okay. uh, a tested step for curtailing inflation. Will it be effective enough? It's left to be seen. Okay. Uh, well, that's that's the thing. Uh, well, all the, the the universal laws have have been defied in the Nigerian context. You know, it works everywhere else. When it comes here, we don't see how it works. But let's, good luck to the Central Bank of Nigeria. Good luck to Nigeria. Good luck to all of us. But we'd like to thank you at this point, Mr. Bola Honolodjede, for coming and sharing your time with us and your thoughts as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mm. Okay. We've been talking with Mr. Bolahon Olojede, public affairs analyst. Uh, we'll take a break now. Uh, and when we return, our second hot topic will be up. Stay with us.